Chapter twenty three Lady Lavinia Goes to the Play Part two of Black Moth by Georgette Heyer Read for LibriVox dot org into the public domain. When they were once in the deserted passage behind the boxes, he turned eagerly towards her. Well, my dearest, well? Lady Lavinia's mouth drooped miserably. Yes, she said, I shall have to come with you. The tone was damping, to say the least, but he did not seem to notice it. Lavinia, you mean it? Yes, she assented, still more dejectedly. My beautiful love, you will really come, when, at once. Uh, oh, no, no. Darling, the sooner the better. I understand tis a great step to expect you to take in a hurry, but I assure you tis wisest. Can you come to-morrow? Her big eyes dilated. No, no, I, oh, I cannot leave Dicky so soon, she ended with a sob. "'But, Lavinia, my dearest, you surely do not want to stay with him,' he cried. "'Yes, I do,' she answered. "'I—I I don't want to ever leave him.' This blighting speech left him gasping. "'But you—heavens, what are you saying? You love me.' "'No, I don't,' she contradicted. "'I always said I didn't. I love my husband.' "'You are distraught,' he exclaimed. "'If you love him, why do you consent to elope with me?' She looked at him reproachfully. "'There is no one else,' she said mournfully. "'Good Lord, what? I have to elope with some one, because Dick doesn't love me any more, you see. I will come with you, and I will try to be good.' He kissed her hand quickly. "'Sweetheart, I still think you are not yourself. You will think differently to-morrow. You do not really love Carstairs.' She shut her mouth obstinately, tilting her regal little head. He watched her anxiously. "'If you really do love him, tis ridiculous to elope with me,' he said. Her fingers tightened on his wrist. "'But I must. You don't understand, Harry. You must take me. Don't you want me?' "'Of course I do. But not if you are longing to be somewhere else all the time. The whole thing seems preposterous.' "'Tis all dreadful, dreadful. I have never been so unhappy in my life. I—oh, I wish I had not been so heedless and selfish.' Lovelace pondered for a moment as they stood outside her box. Then, seeing that people were returning to their seats, he opened the door and took her in. "'Listen, dear, this is the maddest scheme I ever heard, but if you are determined you shall carry it through. Come to my lodgings to-morrow evening. Bring as little baggage as possible. I will have all ready, and we will post at once to Dover. Then, in time, I hope you will forget Richard and come to care for me a little.' "'You are very, very good, Harry.' "'Yes, I will do just as you say, and, oh, I am sorry to put you out like this. I am not but a plague to every one, and I wish I were dead. You don't really love me, and I shall be a burden.' "'I do indeed love you,' he assured her, but within himself he could not help wishing that he had not fallen quite so passionately in love with her. "'I'll leave you now, sweet, for your husband will be returning at any moment.' He kissed her hands lightly. "'A demain, fairest.' How she sat through the last act, Lavinia could never afterwards imagine. She was longing to be at home, so soon to be home no longer, and quiet. Her head ached now, as Richard had ached for weeks. More than anything did she want to rest it against her husband's shoulder, so temptingly near, and to feel his sheltering arms about her. But Dick was in love with Isabella Fanshawe, and she must sit straight and stiff in her chair and smile at the proper places. At last the play was ended. The curtain descended on the bowing archer, and the house stamped and clapped its appreciation. The curtain rose again. What? Not finished yet? Ah, no, it was but Garrick leading Mrs. Clive forward. Would they never have done? Mrs. Fleming was standing. She supposed they were going, and got up. Someone put her cloak about her shoulders. Richard, for the last time. Mr. Holt escorted her to the coach, and put her and her cousin into it. He and Mr. Fleming had their chairs, so only Richard and Tracy went with the ladies. The Flemings were staying with friends in Brook Street, just off Grosvenor Square, so that when they had put Harriet down, only a few more yards remained to be covered. Lavinia wondered dully why Tracy had elected to come with them. What did he want? Was he going to warn Dick of her intended flight? He little knew the true state of affairs. At the foot of the staircase at Wincham House she turned to say good night. She merely nodded to Tracy but to Dick she extended her hand. He took it in his, kissing it, and she noticed how cold were his fingers, how burning hot his lips. Then he released her, and she went slowly up the stairs to her room. His grace watched her through his eyeglass. When she was out of sight, he turned and surveyed Richard critically. "'If that is the way you kiss a woman, Lavinia has my sympathies,' he remarked. 
Richard's lips tightened. He picked up a strand of lighted candles and ushered his grace into the drawing-room. "'I presume you did not come to tell me that?' he asked. "'Your presumption is correct, Richard. I have come to open your eyes. You are too kind.' His grace laid his hat on the table and sat down on the arm of a chair. "'I think perhaps I am. It may interest you to hear that Lavinia attempts to elope with our gallant friend, the captain.' Richard bowed. "'You knew it?' "'Certainly.' Andover looked him over. "'May I ask what steps you are taking to prevent her?' "'None.' His grace's expression was quite indescribable. For a moment he was speechless, and then he reverted to heavy sarcasm. "'Pray remember to be at hand to conduct her to her chair,' she drawled. "'Upon my soul, you sicken me.' "'I am grieved. There is a remedy,' replied Carstairs, significantly. Tracy ignored the suggestion. "'I suppose it is nothing to you that you lose her. No, it is nothing to you that she disgraces her name. Oh, no. My name, I think. Our name. Is it possible for her to disgrace yours?' Richard went white, and his hand flew instinctively to his sword-hilt. Tracy looked at him. "'Do you think I would soil my blade with you?' he asked very softly. Richard's hand fell from his hilt. His eyes searched the other's face. "'You know,' he asked at last, quite calmly. "'You fool,' answered his grace gently. "'You fool, do you think I have not always known?' Richard leaned on the mantel-shelf. "'You never thought I was innocent? You knew that night? You guessed?' The Duke sneered. "'Knowing both, could I suspect other than you?' he asked insultingly. "'Oh, my God!' cried Carstairs suddenly. "'Why could you not have said so before?' The Duke's eyes opened wide. "'It has chafed you, eh? I knew it would. I've watched you.' He chuckled beneath his breath. "'And those fools never looked beneath the surface. One and all they believed that John would cheat. John! They swallowed it tamely and never even guessed at the truth. You at least did not believe?' "'I, hardly. Knowing you for a weak fool and him for a chaotic fool, I rather jumped to conclusions. Instead you tried to throw the blame on him. I would to God you had exposed me.' So you have remarked. I confess I do not understand this heroic attitude. Why should I interfere in what was none of my business? What proof had I? Why did you raise no demur? What motive had you? I should have thought it fairly obvious. Richard stared at him, puzzled. God, Richard, but you are singularly obtuse. Have I not pointed out that John was a chaotic fool? When did I say he was a weak one? You mean— You mean you wanted Lavinia to marry me, because you thought to squeeze me as you willed? asked Carstairs slowly. His grace's thin nostrils wrinkled up. "'You are so crude,' he complained. "'It suited you that Jack should be disgraced. You thought I should seize his money. You—you—' "'Rogue. But you will admit that I at least am an honest rogue. You are a, a dishonest saint. I would sooner be what I am.' "'I know there is nothing on God's earth more vile than I am,' replied Carstairs violently. His grace sneered openly. "'Very pretty, Richard, but a little tardy, methinks.' He paused, and something seemed to occur to me. "'Tis why you purpose to let Lavinia go, I suppose. You confess the truth on Friday, eh?' Richard bowed his head. "'I have not the right to stop her. She chooses her own road.' "'She knows?' sharply. "'She has always known.' "'The jade! And I never guessed it!' He paused. "'Yes, I understand your heroic attitude. I am sorry I cannot pander to it. In spite of all of this, I cannot permit my sister to ruin herself. She were as effectually ruined, and she stayed with me. Pshaw! After seven years, who is like to care, one way or the other, which of you cheated? Play the man for once, and stop her. She loves Lovelace, I tell you. What of it? She will recover from that. No, I cannot ask her to stay with me. It would be damnably selfish. His grace appeared exasperated. For God, you are a fool. Ask her. Ask her. Force her. Kick Lovelace from your house, and abandon the heroic pose, I beg of you. Do you suppose I want to lose her? cried Carstairs. Tis because I love her so much that I will not stand in the way of her happiness. The Duke flung round and picked up his hat. I am sorry I cannot join with you in your heroics. I must take the matter into my own hands, as usual, it seems. Lord, but you should have learnt to make her obey you, my good Dick. She has led you by the nose ever since she married you, and she was a woman who wanted mastering. He went over to the door and opened it. I will call upon you to-morrow, when I shall hope to find you more sane. They do not purpose to leave until late, I know, for Lovelace is promised to Malaby at three o'clock. There is time in which to act. I shall not interfere, repeated Richard. His grace sneered. So you have remarked. It remains for me to do. Good night. 
End of chapter 23, part 2. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.